Dr. Ron Sinna. Z, it's been too long, man. Good back, buddy. <laughs> Welcome to the show. You haven't lost the accent yet, huh? No, I thought all the westernization would change that, man. Every day it gets only more powerful only. <laughs> Only more powerful only. Oh, God. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> listen, I love it. Listen, oh, the fact that you've been on the show multiple times attests to my- uh, Desperation for desperate. finding a host. <laughs> How did you know? I know. It's so predictable. To my, to my deep admiration and respect you. for you. Thank but you. I'd love it if you told the audience kind of your sort of description of what you do in medicine, because I think it's important. Ah, oh, that's a good yeah. point. So in medicine, I'm an internal medicine doctor, started off doing the usual primary care stuff. But then over a decade ago, what I started noticing was a lot of metabolic lifestyle issues coming through the door that I couldn't address, you know, diabetes at an early age, heart disease at earlier ages, and what we learn about in medical school. And really, long story short, that kind of shifted me towards a completely different path. And by the way, I, I want to mention this because although I talk about sensationalist stuff, you know, in the early days were early heart attacks in 30s and 40s. The data's caught up to see. This is not anecdotal anymore. It's not just a South Asian thing. If you look at the latest heart disease rates now, we're now looking at CDC data that's showing death rates are going up from heart disease. So mm. from 1999 to 2011, death rates were going down thanks yeah. to maybe statins and interventional cardiology, advanced procedures. Maybe less smoking. Maybe less smoking, exactly. The yeah. campaigns around no smoking, absolutely. But from 2011 to 2017, we're seeing death rates go up. During the pandemic, it spiked even more. And the age group it's hitting the hardest is 45 to 64. Wait a so, minute, that's yeah, my age that's, demographic. That's right. Mm. So this, this is a global issue. It's not just a nuanced thing. And, and I'll tell you through the pandemic, again, anecdotally, in my clinic, I am getting a significant spike in early heart disease patients just coming in, even more than baseline. And now when I'm checking heart scans, it's like it's not – it's almost becoming a norm for me to see 40-year-olds with coronary calcium scans that are showing early arterial damage. So wow. this is already an issue before when I started the work, but now – it's really on steroids, you know, given our lifestyles, the stress, increasingly sedentary lifestyles and all that. So that's kind of my passion is blogging, podcasting, writing books, d designing a lifestyle program to really address these situations so we can get the word out there. And being on shows like this, man, that reach billions of people, right? So, Dude, you know, <laughs> yeah, it, it, and you're in the right place, Silicon Valley. This is the crucible of yeah. metabolic disease, stress, totally. cortisol, all those things. Completely. Now, you said lifestyle medicine, which is, which is very important, like, Actually addressing the root causes of our disease, right, is actually addressing how we live, how we eat, how we yeah. how we deal with stress. But you just recently re-upped your internal medicine boards, man. Mm, God, and you remind me. Yeah. And, and you know how I know this? Because I see the binders here for the review. <laughs> show, show, okay. show the people. Okay, for, <laughs> and just for people who don't know, the American Board yeah, of Internal please. Medicine, which is a mafia organization, Ron does not endorse this statement, but I will. <laughs> um, they make money on the backs of frontline physicians to recertify their board certification, which has really no good evidence that it actually improves the outcomes for patients. So every 10 years, we have to take this big test or do an onerous series of maintenance of certifications that cost money and time when we're already super stressed. But the key thing is it may not apply at all to the care of patients. So what was your experience? Right? Yeah. So first of all, yeah, taking the test after 10 years, sitting in for an eight hour exam, spending the last few months studying for this darn exam, and realizing that the test questions I'm doing are no different than they were 10 years ago. Jeez. Now, coming back to lifestyle medicine, again, being in primary care, I already talked about the heart disease epidemic. The good news on that front is 90% of that disease is lifestyle related. We mm -hmm. know that from the MESA trial, which is multi-ethnic studies on atherosclerosis, very well regarded, but 90% is lifestyle driven. Even cancer, interestingly, our CDC even has admitted on their website in a, in a summary report that most of the cancers, 13 of them are lifestyle related, and they actually mention insulin. So I'm really pretty shocked by that. So wow, you take, CDC did CDC that. actually uh -huh. is, is surprising. They mention inflammation, insulin resistance, connection to cancer. Changes are so, coming. So changes, yeah. <laughs> right, changes are happening. But let's take that. So you would think that when I'm certifying for this test, I'd have questions around lifestyle. So I brought these two exhibits, exhibit A and exhibit B, <laughs> which are basically my review books. Each of these weighs like um, uh, 15, 20 look. pounds, show, right? So show the people. And, and actually we'll no disrespect guys. to the company because they did prepare me for the test. But the content, and I just wanted to show you, out of these two oh, yeah, 20 the pound fine. contents, We're not taking the company's crap fine. On the company, totally. Right. They, hopefully I'm going to pass, you know, but I'm, you know, <laughs> that, that was fine. But if I look through these binders, there were only three pages in these binders that actually mentioned lifestyle. I just want to read you what, what they basically had. So one of these pages is maintain normal body weight, diet rich in fruits, vegetables, low fat, dairy, and reduced fat, 
Um, reduce sodium to less than 1.5 grams per day and 90 to 150 minutes of exercise per week and moderate alcohol consumption. So that's one page. So, so that's Another what they expect one. doctors that, to know that's about That's what we should on. know. Yeah. yeah. This one under endocrinology basically just says lose weight, about 7% of body weight, increase physical activity and follow up counseling. That's it. And then the last page here, same <laughs> stuff. Exercise 150, limit salt to less than 2.5, 2.5 grams per day. Oh yeah. And screen for obstructive sleep apnea. I mean, this is all I had. And when I took the test, I paid attention to it. Eight hours of test, not a single question on lifestyle, zero. And these diseases that we face in the clinic on a day-to-day basis, I'm not just diet, right? Stress reduction, sleep, not just sleep apnea, but how do you manage common sleep disorders? I'm like, what the heck are we doing, Z? Dude, well, uh, what we're doing is left brain medicine. And I talk about this as a model, like left brain, right brain. Right brain is this holistic, integrative, yes and, sees everything in its context, is a contextual brain. And it's silent because it doesn't have language. And the left brain has language, but it kind of evolved as the emissary, the tool of the right to go and grasp and reduce and put things into pieces like lose seven pounds, uh, screen for sleep apnea, this kind of thing. Now, as a tool, that's great, but it turns out left brain has the voice And over time, societies, individuals, and organizations become more left brain reductionist. And that's what's happened to medicine. Mm -hmm. Medicine used to be more of that art, more of that intuition. More instinctive intuition, exactly. That's right. Now, what they're testing you on is that reductionist left brain thing. And Mm -hmm. and that's why we have terrible outcomes in the developed world for Mm -hmm. chronic diseases, incredible amounts of cost, and huge amounts of suffering. Yeah. So I think you nailed it, which is why, again, I love having you on the show because you you you, you put it in sharp relief. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually refused to recertify for ABIM. So I recertified for NBPAS, which is a competing board okay. uh, whose um, founder I've had on the show too. But again, boards aside, yeah. what are we teaching people? Now, now speaking of which, our mutual friend, Peter Atia, mm. whose uh, podcast you've been on, I've, I've done shows with him as well. Yeah. I'm just curious if you saw recently, uh, he did a National Geographic uh, series with Chris Hemingsworth. Oh, Thor. Chris Hemsworth. You know, people yeah. have been telling me about it. I haven't watched it yet though. Yeah, interesting. So, yeah. so yeah. it's funny. So it's a Netflix my, special or something, right? It, yeah, it was on uh, oh, I think it was National Geo. Geographic. Okay. On, you yeah. can see it on yeah. Disney Plus. Okay. So the, I heard about it too through the grapevine yeah. and, and I didn't want to text Peter about it because I, yeah. I got to see this. So my family and I am like, hey, let's watch my friend Peter like yeah. school Thor on fasting. And right. it was hilarious because- you know Peter. Sure. He's got. He's got. Which we're going to talk about the continuous glucose monitor. Nice tattoo which is, there. Yeah. Hey, totally. you know what? <laughs> I I wanted ink. I got ink. Courtesy of you. Yeah, thank you, you bullied me into getting I this did. thing, which we're going to talk I'm about. I'm a CGM bully. I'm sorry. Yeah. And it was ahead. great. You know what? I've been right. bullied by by bigger people. I've been bullied by fatter people. I've been bullied by less Indian people. Um, but I've never been bullied into having a probe inserted onto my body and actually <laughs> complying. And it yeah, was great. It's that's the best what I do best, ever. yep. <laughs> <laughs> right, so. So, so Peter is with Thor in Australia <laughs> and they're gonna, he's bullied Thor into a four day fast Whew. with the glucose monitor. Why, and in order to break his fast, Thor has to go spear fishing, doing a deep dive, holding his breath for like three minutes to catch his own fish, to mm. end the fast. And mm. this was the most entertaining thing oh my gosh. I've seen because, you know, yeah. they do this extreme close up with yeah. Peter and yeah. with Thor. Now with yeah. Thor, you can you can get an extreme close up and he's just stunningly beautiful. <laughs> and strangely with Peter, the same thing. Yeah. But even my wife was like, that's too close because the camera was like this. Oh, and, wow. and you see Peter and he's just like, he's this close. <laughs> right. And he, he's like, the thing about a four day fast is when the beta hydroxybutyrate ketone <laughs> reaches three parts per million, your brain is like a diamond saw drilling into the center of the earth. You just see, and I was just laughing oh my, my ass off. But yeah, so anyway, so back to this. Yeah. By the way, at some point we should come back to fasting because I want to tell you some of the not so good results that I see in my patients, but we'll come back to that. Okay, Let's that's important that. because yeah. I think um, as someone who does one meal a day, Yeah. Uh, this is interesting to me. Yeah. And I, and again, I, I think there's some, even in my own personal experience, there's some mixed mm-hmm. personal data on even the one meal That's a right. day. That's right. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Totally. So we got, okay, let's think what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about this continuous glucose monitoring as a way to look at metabolic health, diet, yeah. stress, et cetera. Right. We're going to talk about fasting. Yep. We're going to talk about, is there anything else in lifestyle medicine you wanted to hit? I think those are the big ones. We always end up talking a little bit about 
stress, maybe a little bit on sleep because I'm getting invited to a lot of talks on sleep as well too. I'm not a sleep expert, but there are some things I'd like to share because it has such a profound impact on glucose metabolism. So, And you know what? We're going to we're gonna actually tie we'll that cover. all into the results I had from my own oh, yeah. glucose monitor. That'll be perfect. Yeah. So it's great. So, so fill us in on how you got me hooked on this, uh, trying out this monitor and what's involved and yeah, I'll tell definitely. you my perspective. Well, let's talk. I mean, first, back in the early days before CGMs were really as accessible and affordable, I was finger stick glucosing myself all the time. Yeah, just I Just to that. sort of see what the different responses are, the kind of a painful process, but definitely data trends were um, being seen in terms of lifestyle measures and what it does to glucose. But once the CGMs became more accessible and I started using them in the clinic, it was just a game changer. I mean, as much as you try to motivate people to make the right changes until they see that continuous stream of data coming back at them, they, they will not change, you know? So just seeing dramatic reductions in glucose and triglycerides and body weight just from using this tool has been powerful. Powerful. I tell people it's like the best activity monitor out there because when people see their glucose spikes start to flatten after walking, it's just incredible. It just gets people motivated to do these things that they instinctively know that they should do. But until you see that number, it's a completely different experience. So, so now really through my medical group, we're actually even launching programs where I'm teaching people at scale how to use these sensors. I prescribe them and then we teach them through virtual programs how to learn to use these. And, and the results have been astounding. And one key thing I want to say is that sometimes we assume that these sorts of devices are designed for techies in Silicon Valley. But we've run cohorts with transportation workers, with teachers, like people from all different backgrounds, tech, non-tech, et cetera. And it's having an incredible impact on their health. We're even working potentially with casino workers. And that'd be huge because that's like the breeding ground for insulin resistance. You got Native Americans, Asian Indians, and Latinos. And how do we teach them in certain ways to use this tool? Because as you can imagine, those are populations that are not coming in to see the doctor often at all. They have limited healthcare access. But if you give them a sensor and you teach them in a language-specific way how to use this and drive lifestyle changes, potentially we can have some game-changing improvements with that too. That's so, fantastic. And yeah. you know, it's interesting that you mentioned casino, work, casino workers because at Turntable Health, our clinic in Las Vegas, one of our populations that we took care of was the Culinary Workers Union population. They were the yeah. casino workers. And they, a lot of them were very metabolically ill. And, yeah. and we would look into the root causes and find that, oh, you know what? As one of their perks, they wouldn't get free healthy food. They would get free unlimited fountain drinks. Mm. And so they were drinking these sugar sweetened oh, beverages, yeah. and and Jeez. again, you 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 have to have you have to have it on your radar that those are unhealthy and many people don't. Yeah. And so you, they were showing up like that. Now, what, so with this continuous glucose monitor, you mentioned tech people, it's true that the learning curve is, is subtle. Mm -hmm. And the way that you taught us to use it, so both me and my wife signed up after you bullied me. <laughs> and then I told my wife, I was like, because my wife has some degree of insulin resistance that's genetic. Even though she's skinny, she's Asian. Yeah. Her dad has uh, frank diabetes mm -hmm. and he's 98 pounds. Mm. And so it's just kind of a, a, a mostly inherited thing. Yeah. And what she found is she had gestational diabetes. And then recently her hemoglobin A1C has been up like yeah. 6.2. Mm -hmm. And then she did some diet changes and it got down to 5.9 or something. Yeah. But she was interested in this. So yeah. we signed up and you had a quick little video and a series of instructions yeah. and it was really seamless. Yeah. And the first thing was installing it, <laughs> which by the way, is so intimidating when you don't know what it is. It's a good point. Yeah, so the applicator itself has a large needle. Yeah. So people assume that needle's gonna be stuck inside their That's skin. That's right. But it just basically introduces a sensor and the sensor, I don't know if it's better for you to show on your camera, yeah, but there's I'm a not... tiny filament that's like a dent piece of dental floss or a this is nose hair. A nose hair, <laughs> right? So that's a good, here, that's like, it. it's the size it of a nickel and it's, Super lightweight, right? Yeah, you see the that when you're wearing your arm. So, so basically, the applicator, the needle just pokes the skin. You apply it, and I tell people, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm exaggerating, but it's less painful than a capillary finger stick, a blood draw, or a vaccine, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, and you're not even aware that it's on after like the first few minutes, basically. That, that's so, right. So yeah. you you look because my wife, when she did hers first, she took off. I should have warned you guys about the needle. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> but you know what? Right. It was actually good. It was a yeah. good learning experience. Yeah, she took it off. And she saw the needle, and both of us were like, "Damn, <laughs> that's going to be in our arm." And uh, right. And so there's that little bit of weird nocebo effect yeah. where you're like, oh, yeah. this is gonna hurt. Yeah. You put it in, you don't feel any, right. I didn't feel anything. Exactly. But then what happened with me, because I have a little bit of muscle mass there. I see is, flexing. That's, that's well, you know, I'm doing it on purpose yeah. to try <laughs> yeah, to show right, off. Totally. Like, yeah. hey guys, like, uh, <laughs> but but it, it, it yeah. I had the nocebo effect where I really did feel it for the first few hours where it would, if I moved it or I did something, I would feel almost like a muscle mm -hmm. tension or spasm. Yeah. My wife didn't have that, but she had a sense that she could feel it there. After a couple, 
three, four hours, yeah. there was nothing. And the next day, now I don't notice it at all, Fantastic. like zero, nothing. Yeah. And, um, and so it's actually from that standpoint, compared to a finger stick oh, yeah. where you're, you're stabbing oh, yourself. Totally, totally. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's yeah. a piece of cake. Yeah. And just an FYI for people that might be trying this, you do want to grab. So we pick this location behind the arm. I like it under the tricep because if you lie on your side and you put pressure on it, you can get um, erroneous readings from that. Mm -hmm. You do want to make sure it's under the fatty tissue. You know, you don't have any fat, right? You're all muscle. Oh, dude, there's but, yeah. fat there. <laughs> It's right. just hiding. <laughs> yeah, because if it does enter the muscle, you can get er erroneous read uh, readings. You can get some blood, you know, from the muscle as well, too. So that can throw things off. But yeah. And you know what? That's interesting that you, yeah. you mentioned that because I noticed that um, when, when the sensor is new. Yeah. And it's calibrating or whatever it does. It's wacky. I, yeah. It's wacky. Yeah. And if I lift weights, like yeah. if I go to do a curl or something mm -hmm. and I look at the real time thing, that yeah. next reading is True. spuriously high. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just it, because it's near muscle or in muscle. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But then it, it evens out after that. It, I hadn't It does. That. It gets yeah. smarter and smarter. And then all of a sudden the data is really much more correlated. That's so, right. So yeah, just like any tool, I, I think the issue here, and this is a key point because a lot of folks are learning about these and they're going to their busy primary care doctor saying, doc, give me glucose sensor. And really, again, a typical primary care doctor is not going to know even how to order it. So that's a hassle. And and then we know our primary care colleagues are inundated with work, EHR work, et cetera. And really in my clinical practice, I get tons of questions. Why did my glucose go up X amount after mm -hmm. eating a banana? So, yeah. so that's why I put the program together is because we want to provide the right level of education. We want to reduce uh, anxiety around the sensor. Because even though we know the physiology, when you see a glucose level go up, it can cause people to stop eating. They're like, oh my God, why am yeah. I getting a glucose spike? Yeah. There's all these little psychological head games you start playing with yourself. A little so, neurosis. Yeah. yeah, a little neurosis around it. So it, it's an important tool, but I think you know having the right people teach how to do it the right way goes a long way. And don't assume your doctor's outdated if they say no. That's the other thing. Because I've heard podcasts where people are like, well, if your doctor doesn't order a sensor, they're outdated. You no, know, no, no, no. I, I hate hearing yeah, stuff like that yeah. from the wellness community. They just critique doctors. Oh, they didn't order fasting insulin. Get a new doctor. I'm like, do you know we have a primary care shortage? You know, you're yeah. telling these people to get a new doctor, and you're yeah. breeding skepticism in primary care doctors for doing that. That kills me. That's a different topic. But yeah, that's like, another yeah. topic, and it yeah, also totally. goes to like the, the yeah. it's not so much lifestyle medicine, but sometimes in functional medicine, yeah. Yeah. you see like the same guy who's saying that is ordering like a trillion of these that's obscure, not like, evidence based toxin yeah. tests. That's yeah, totally. not evidence based, and yeah, yeah. 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 So, so yeah, so so I, I like actually what quick point. I just want to <laughs> say real quickly because I'm seeing so much of this. There is a primary care health crisis. I'm seeing individuals because of the pandemic, they're not getting their health screenings mm -hmm. done. And when the health and wellness community breeds skepticism about your doctor, they're going to be less likely to get their colonoscopy, yeah. their mammogram and all that stuff yeah. done. So just a little side note here, just really stay connected to your primary care doctors. Because I have patients coming to see me for consult. They're like, I'm going to drop my doctor because of X, Y, and Z. And I'm oh. like, I know your doctor. You're lucky you have this as your primary care yeah. doctor. Like keep that primary care doctor. Yeah. I'll help you with the other step, but don't drop him because you listen to a podcast saying that. And so, you know yeah. what? Honestly, yeah. it's not fair because the primary care docs, they're operating from that manual that yeah. you're learning from because that's, that's right. how they're trained and taught. Exactly. And actually a lot of the stuff in the manual is absolutely key. Agreed. Like you said, colonoscopy, all the, all yeah. the other stuff primary yeah. care docs do. But what you've done is you've kind of said, okay, this is a, a kind of a new and burgeoning thing. And you've created a program and a design around it that's actually, it, it's complex enough understanding that you've simplified yeah. that I think it would be very difficult, like you said, in today's environment to ask primary care people to do it off the bat, oh, yeah. unless yeah. it's part of the training overall. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So, so I was deeply grateful to have you as a guide because you sent an email that had like pretty much all the stuff yeah. and it wasn't even that long. And it's like, okay, okay, okay. Any question I have, it's mostly here yeah. and other stuff we're going to talk. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure that the screen is- Oh yeah, it's we're it, good. It does okay. that. Yeah, I think we're still yeah, recording. We're good, okay. I, believe me, I, <laughs> At right. this point, like all the tech stuff, you know, we were talking about, oh, you don't have to be a Silicon Valley techie. Yeah, but you do to run this damn show. Yeah, it sure does. And yeah. then my daughter does the edits now oh and she's gosh. 11. That's amazing. And I'm hoping that is when that she- Is that legal? Yeah. <clears throat> no. <laughs> well, it is uh, for tax purposes. <laughs> yeah, very, oh, nice, okay. <laughs> as far as the sweatshop aspect of it goes, maybe less so. When we're talking about cortisol levels. Hers are through the roof when she has to edit my videos. Uh, sure. Because I'm like, listen, girl. <laughs> I want to make sure that every single cut back and forth, oh if you show Ron for one more microsecond than he needs to be shown, and you're not on my beautiful face, then something is wrong. Oh I don't God, know why I'm thing. even talking like this, oh, I know. I've got to get a therapist already. Daisy yeah. yeah, I know, <laughs> right, I know, <laughs> a couple therapists. So, um, so, you, so, so you had um, prescribed it, Yep. and this was fascinating. And can I mention the pharmacy? Sure. Yeah, okay. yeah, totally, totally. You had named this pharmacy called Alto Pharmacy, A-L-T-O, yeah. and I was, I'd was i never heard of them. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked at 
the level of service. And yeah. so this is what happened. Alto Pharmacy, well, it's like a virtual pharmacy, right? Yeah. And they're yeah. based in they're San Francisco. They're kind of like a DoorDash of pharmacies, right? Exactly. So, yeah, it's amazing, yeah. So you, call, you uh, send the prescription there, I yeah. imagine. Then I get an email, I yeah. sign up for their little app mm -hmm. and I click a couple things. They have my insurance information, yeah. everything's there. Next thing I know, they're like, so we'd like to uh, courier yeah. the uh, medication, which is this device, yeah. to your home today. Yeah. And it yeah. was a Sunday. Yeah. And I know. It, yeah, you got it on Sunday. It came within amazing. three hours. Yeah. yeah. No, Psh, shout out to them. Uh, honestly, they dude. make the process frictionless. And, and that's a big part of the CGM too is, again, a lot of doctors are going to say no, which is understandable. It's not guideline driven. But even after you get it, the pricing varies between different pharmacies. Right. Do they have it in stock? Do we need a prior auth? But Alta does an amazing job of just cutting all that and just getting the sense in your hands, which is a great. They're not in every state yet. I hope they are because they really do an amazing job. And, and the pricing is much more consistent when we go through them. So It yeah. was really predictable. Yeah, Can yeah. I say what I paid? No, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. So, so, what after insurance or whatever, I paid seventy four dollars for a month supply of sensor. Yeah, that's which typical. Is, listen, for what I'm getting out of it, yeah, uh, that's absolutely. A value. I've never. I've had people from all different backgrounds take this. No one has ever told me that this is a waste of money. I right. mean, instead, what they're spending hundreds of dollars on supplements, like you mentioned, yeah. right? That are doing absolutely nothing for them totally. in most cases. So, so it's a no brainer for most people. Or the copay yeah. for their hospital admission for oh a massive. God, uh, you no know. kidding. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Or, or yeah. even yeah. A, a, you know. There's uh, there's so much to oh, say, yeah. Oh, yeah. but but so <clears throat> when once we got it, it was couriered. We read the instructions. We listen to your thing. We I put it on the the. There's an app, mm -hmm. right? For freestyle. This is the freestyle, right. freestyle Libre, Libre, exactly. And three, yeah. And uh, the app then connects. It just scans it, yeah. and the next thing you know, after about an hour of sensor adjustment, it then starts giving you readings. Yep, you got it. And, Every uh, minute, yeah. And then you become a, a weirdo addict <laughs> to looking at the readings, yeah. Because totally. there is that neurosis component, which totally. I'm sure. You know, you could say different things about it, mm -hmm. but it did get me very engaged in my yeah. diet and my stress and Your my sleep. Your diet was pretty good already. Were there some other changes that you made while <clears throat> so you So were... recently I've made quite a few changes. Actually, after the last um, meditation retreat that I did, they had only vegetarian food at this thing. And yeah. I was like, you know what? I could be down with a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm Mr. Like history of keto. Right. I'm one meal a day. I tend to avoid refined carbohydrates whenever I can and yeah. too many carbohydrates if possible. Mm -hmm. And recently my lipids, you know, like my LDL was about around 160 initially mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. earlier in the year. And by the way, I get all my labs now through, uh, I do direct through um, Ulta Labs. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. and so I just pay cash and it's so much cheaper yeah. than the copay through any. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. So I just order them myself. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Um, I've only had two sets. So the first one, uh, LDL was 160, HDL was around 50. Mm -hmm. Then the second one, after a little more plant-based introduction, yeah. LDL was 140, mm -hmm. HDL was still 50. Yeah. And triglycerides are always like almost unmeasurable. They're Beautiful. all quite low, so that's yeah. good. And I have no inflammation, so HSCRP was low. So I thought, you know, I, maybe I could do plant-based diet because I lost some weight on the last mm -hmm. retreat and had kind of kept it off. Yeah. And so that was one of the big shifts that I'd done is more pastas mm -hmm. and uh, like even these like deep or, or uh, uh, oven baked pizza things that I would make. So more carbs than I would normally do. Right, so right. So that was a change in my diet. Yeah. So I was curious with the CGM, like what we would see. Yeah. And uh, I've learned quite a bit. <laughs> uh, so it's really quite interesting. Yeah. So one of the, so I don't, should I dive into what I learned or, what, or do you have thoughts? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so just at a high level, I wanna say, so when we've talked about insulin resistance before, the, the term that's kind of synonymous with that is carbohydrate tolerance. Like mm. each individual, how many grams, what's the load of carbohydrate that each person can actually handle? And in my clinic, before I used CGM, I just sort of, it'd be kind of guesswork, like mm -hmm. looking at your physical activity levels. Yeah, let's put you at about 100 or 150. But the sensor really allows you to understand how much can you really handle. Like often I've guesstimated like 150 for someone, but they're doing 250, 300 based on their metabolism, their physical activity, and their numbers or markers or glucose is fine. So, you know, again, this is not an anti-carb movement. It's just really matching your carbohydrate to your activity and your metabolism. On the other hand, somebody that's significantly <coughs> insulin resistant with not a lot of muscle mass. And by the way, I have a growing number of Asian females in my practice. And their main issue, it's not genetics, partly genetics. It's a lack of muscle mass. Yeah. They cannot clear glucose adequately. And when they over fast, it makes the problem worse. Because when I do body composition scanning at baseline and follow up, 
about half of their weight loss is muscle loss. So this is a really key point about fasting and restrictive dieting is if you're not getting adequate protein and you're not lifting heavy weights, you're losing at least 30 to 50% muscle mass. And that, my friends, is a recipe for disaster as we age. When you go back to normal eating again off the diet, your glucose is going to get worse. So really key point. And I used to do the OMAD, the one meal a day, but I found that it was very difficult for me to get the amount of protein that I needed. And that's actually, you know, when I looked at my DEXA scans, I did one before the pandemic and just recently, I had not lost, but my despite the amount of lifting I was doing, I didn't really gain much lean body mass at all, which is kind of surprising with the amount of lifting I was doing. But I realized that my protein intake was deficient. So something really key to keep in mind. Man, that's a really good point because what I've noticed with my wife and with myself is, again, when you start to shift a little more plant-based, one of the <clears throat> orig- instant sort of sacrifices, if you're not mindful of it, is the protein. Yeah. And one meal a day, again, like you said, how much protein can you eat in that meal, especially yeah. if it's more plant-based? Right, right. Yeah, uh, it, it is And limited. you need about three times more plant-based protein to get the immune acids to activate mTOR for muscle activation. So, so you can imagine, it's almost impossible to get adequate right. amounts of protein through that. Again, right. I'm not, I'm not bagging on the diet or the one meal a day, but I'm just saying we have to be aware of those nuances. And if you're not really assessing that, you might very quickly lose more muscle mass than you, you, you think you would. It can and, really sneak up on you. And, and, and part of the reason, and you've mentioned this before, that muscle mass is important is those are, muscle cells are parking lots for glucose. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. I bet 80% of the carbohydrates you consume should be cleared by muscle and a healthy metabolism. And with now most of the US population, the global population facing some degree of insulin resistance, our muscles are literally not doing the heavy lifting of clearing that glucose. So Mm. for losing that, and you'll see, I mean, I think you've experienced, how are you 50 yet? Uh, going to be 50 in yeah. April. Yeah. yeah. And, and you see, especially 40s, 50s, just holding on to muscle becomes much more challenging. And as we're doing restrictive dieting and not getting of protein, catabolism, sarcopenia, these things can easily get worse. So we just have to keep track of that. Uh, and and I, can, I so when I go on these retreats and I lose weight every single time, I'll lose four or five pounds every yeah. time. And I'm actually maybe even eating more often, like I'm eating two meals a day. Yeah. What I find is when I come back, my ability to say bench press the same amount is gone it is, until yeah. a couple of weeks go by and I'm able to squeeze it back to maybe close to where it was before. So there is muscle loss. Yeah. And um, and you feel it too. There's a certain kind of a, there's a sensation of it that that, that lean mass is kind of lost a little bit. Because yeah. even though you've lost weight, you don't feel necessarily healthier. There's something psychological about it. Yeah. Um, And and I'm not just, I think these retreats, by the way, they're an amazing, I think that's the process and it's fine to sort of go through that. Oh, that's a whole different, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah, Yeah. So it's different. And I feel like I can't imagine having like a hundred grams of protein on a spiritual retreat. That just wouldn't make sense to me. (laughs) Right. right. So it's kind of like a total body cleanse, but then you do have to get back and reset and sort of get into your- that's right. Zone, so, well, one yeah. thing that does happen on the yeah. on the meditation retreat for me is my relationship to food changes. Mm. So instead of it being a kind of a recurrent intrusive thought, especially if you're on a one meal a day kind of thing, it just seems to integrate more with the natural flow of how you are as an organism. Like mm. you're hungry, you eat something. You're not hungry, you don't. So true. Yeah. It, so things just kind of change. But so... Um, so this is very important. So we talk about protein, we talk about one meal a day. So the continuous glucose monitor. So I put it on and and uh, we can talk about my wife separately, but what I yeah. found was quite interesting that um, after it settles, um, first of all, there is a disconjugation for me between the glucometer, which I still have, uh, and the readings on this. So more consistently, the readings on this were roughly 10 to 15 above what the glucometer was telling me. Right. And, uh, but what I found is actually uh, over time, they actually became more concordant mm-hmm. and- um, in the morning, like in the lower ends, they seemed to match more closely to my glucometer, just for me. Mm. So I don't know what the yeah, deal let me, is. Uh, so we should first clarify that this is not measuring blood glucose. So it's basically sitting in the interstitial fluid, mm. right at the tissue layer of the cells. So there's, it's never going to be identical to the blood glucose. And the deviation, they use a um, term called MARDS, which is the mean absolute relative um, deviation. Mm. It's about 9% for most of these sensors. And mm. just to give you a reference, capillary finger stick is between 5 to 10%. Mm. So overall, they are pretty accurate, but it's not going to be dead on. The difference will be higher if you do something that raises your blood glucose really quickly. So if you drank a glass of juice, 
blood glucose is going to go high very quickly, and there might be about a 10 to 15 minute lag before this catches up. Uh, so, so that's where the interstitial fluid exactly. catches up. Exactly. Yeah. If you're fasting, um, obviously there's going to be more concordance just because you know the glucose is stable already. So interstitial yeah. is going to be more of a mirror. Interestingly, um, in contrast to your experience, usually on the low ends, I'm finding more inaccuracies, and typically that's what we see also mm. based on larger data. Mm. Is a hypoglycemic alarms and those hypo episodes. Those tend to be more off mm -hmm. compared to the higher glucose glucose levels like the 160s, 180s, those tend to be mm -hmm. a little bit more accurate. Mm -hmm. And then the different sensors, I'm trying to remember, I think Dexcom tends to run readings a little bit on the lower side, whereas Freestyle might overcall it a little bit. I mm -hmm. might have flipped that out. I have to think about that, but there sure. is a little bit of that <clears throat> sort of sensor deviation too. That makes sense. Yeah. And again, because it's interstitial fluid, it's different, but really you're looking at the relative changes, That's key. the variability, <laughs> the stability, the response to food. So the absolute right. number is maybe less crucial than, exactly. and you always do have the glucometer to double check, especially if you're a diabetic already, and that's a mission critical thing for you giving insulin or something. <clears throat> I'd yeah. say just with sensors in general, whether it's your waist scale that measures body fat, your sleep sensor, your tracker, the absolute precision of the values themselves is usually off by some X percent. But like you said, you're looking at the Delta, like is yeah. my sleep sensor measuring something better? The glucose, you know, you got a good sense of what your average glucose, your variation is. Is that improving over time now? You're really looking for that Delta. That's and, right. Yeah. That's, that's right. So so this is where, where we got interesting. Like uh, I realized a few interesting things that <clears throat> my one meal a day, as predicted, the glucose would start at a certain level in the morning and mm -hmm. it would just like an airplane slowly decline. Yeah until dinner around 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. when you would see it do the thing yeah. that it does. And a couple things that surprised me is um, if I had a meal that was mostly protein, of course, the glucose really wouldn't vary that much. Um, mm -hmm. And it would be, it would come down quickly and then it would be back to a stable level. But if I ate something like a whole wheat pasta, that is technically low glycemic index. Right. And along, and I always would have it with a ton of olive oil and um, other stuff like, you know, legumes, some granola for dessert mm -hmm. with a little bit of milk, a very small bit. And I would have all that. My glucose wouldn't rise very fast. It mm -hmm. would rise a little and it would go down. And then, and, and I'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Like, this yeah. is great. I go to bed <laughs> yeah. around nine because I get up really early. I go to bed early. Right. Uh, and then I'd look at the monitor in the morning and I would see, a series of climbs and dips, climbs and dips, climbs and dips. Yeah. And while I was sleeping till about midnight, my sugars would be rising and then falling and then rising a little higher and then falling. Interesting. Really yeah. interesting. Yeah. And I would correlate that with something I've always kind of intuitively known, but I would have these really intense dreams yeah. um, where I was actually, I would wake up feeling unrested. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I look at the monitor, I go, oh man, like my sugar was doing all kinds of crazy stuff while I was sleeping. I didn't even know it. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious if what you think about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we've seen, first of all, um, when people are doing fasting and their dinners are too early, we often see a lot of fluctuations in hypoglycemic episodes during the nighttime. And if they're wearing an aura ring or a sleep tracker, that can have an influence on their sleep quality. On the contrary, when people are eating too late, like past 8, 8, 30 p.m. and their meals are high glycemic, we do see those glucose fluctuations. So definitely glucose liability at nighttime does affect sleep quality and just overall, just how you feel when you wake up in the morning. We wanna see more stable numbers. So we've seen that for sure. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll say even with optimal sleep, the interesting thing about metabolism is even though you're just still and lying there, when you have a very creative, active mind, you're getting a lot of REM sleep, you've got a lot of thoughts and stresses you're processing, that's a very metabolically active brain activity. And our brain consumes a significant amount of glucose. So, so it's interesting that some people, you know, when I've gotten them to do things like worry journaling. So when we talk about sleep, one of the most effective ways to get yourself to sleep better and deeper is to just write down all your crap onto a piece of paper, write out your to-do list. It's been shown in multiple studies, really helps. But when we're processing those thoughts and emotions during the nighttime, that can really cause a lot of erratic glucose spikes. And I've seen that with my glucose data too. When I offload those thoughts and I go to bed more calm, glucose is much more rock stable. Sleep quality is much better too. So, okay, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Now I have something to test out. <laughs> this is really interesting. Yeah, yeah because uh, it is, I get the sense I wake up with a very unrested, dis, dis, sort of dissatisfied feeling in sleep and I can contrast it. So the other pattern that I've noticed with me um, is 
if I, if I violate the one meal a day, say, and I'll mm -hmm. have something low glycemic during the day, like cottage cheese or eggs in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, and then something at lunch, like a bean salad or something that's kind of, it's got carbohydrates, but yeah. it's not, I don't notice many, many deviations yeah. during the day. And then in the evening, I'll have my meal um, and almost whatever it is at night, the, the, there isn't as much of that glucose variability. And what I find is I'll wake up not even having looked at the monitor and I'm like, man, I slept really good. Like I feel great. And then I look at the thing and I was like, oh, there, there weren't these like sugar fluctuations at night. Yeah. And I wonder if there's a chicken and an egg or a causation correlation thing. Like maybe I was just not stressed that day. And Who knows? Yeah, yeah, there's so many. That's interesting thing about glucose is as much as you'd think it'd be very predictable, like, yes, I eat a high glycemic meal, it's gonna go up. This is th just a fascinating thing about the human body. When you put the layer of cortisol and stress and sleep, gut microbiome, so many different factors just mm. play a role with glucose. And you can see trends and patterns, but, but there is just, so many interesting things that can influence it. And that's why one thing I tell people is like, you don't look at your glucose data like you're looking at the stock market, right? For example, you might eat something like a sweet potato or you might have a piece of fruit that's gonna have great benefits for your gut microbiome. It's more yeah. of a long-term play. Yeah. But if you see that initial glucose spike, you're like, you know what? I'm not gonna eat an apple. You know, it's like exactly. that kind of behavior can really big, be a big problem because now you're depriving yourself of incredible foods. You know, so, so people need to understand that. <laughs> yeah. You know, cause my wife, she has a very different glucose metabolism. So we, you Usually we eat for dessert, we eat a, a bowl of mixed berries, you know, yep. blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. And um, we both ate the bowl. We look at our sugars. Hers instantly shoots to like 140. Right. And then comes down pretty quickly too. Whereas mine does nothing. Yeah. And, and she's like, well, I don't, I'm like nervous to eat berries now. I'm like, dude, these are right. the healthiest things on the planet. Yeah, exactly. So it, it really becomes that kind of- Yeah. So when you look at spikes, one way to think about it, and you know, right now, honestly, we're in a little bit of uncharted territory because mm -hmm. we know what glucose data looks like in diabetics, right? Right. But in metabolically healthy individuals, we have probably less than a dozen studies out there globally. But there are some interesting things that we see that individuals that are young and metabolically healthy with no signs of insulin resistance, Typically, their average sugars throughout the day, 24 seven, they run between 70 to 120. They rarely go up above 120 or 130. Mm. When they have a meal, their postprandial glucose peak is usually not above 120 or 130, maybe up to 140. Mm -hmm. Their glucose recovery times, instead of panicking over the spikes, it's like, how long is that glucose staying up? Now, usually, again, in metabolically healthy individuals, their glucose comes back down to baseline within 30 to 60 minutes. Mm. Once you start getting to 90 minutes and then closer to two hours, mm. if you're not getting back to baseline, then that, that's a sign probably that we're having issues with insulin resistance. Mm. And it's really important, these markers, because I know this is early and a lot of people are like, where's the evidence behind this? I mean, we're seeing this anecdotally, but the beauty of these changes is they're going to proceed insulin resistant markers by up to 10 to 15 years. And I'm not gonna wait for those studies to come out mm -hmm. personally. I'm just already seeing based on glucose variability that these are things we have to pay attention to. And last thing to really keep track of is when you get your glucose A1C tested, You know, so that's the percent value that's your mean blood sugar for the last two to three months. So that's an average number. And the interesting thing is sometimes, for example, I'll see a patient who has an A1C of 5.2 or 5.3%. And right. they're like, great. Then I put a glucose sensor and I find out they're having 14 to 15 hypoglycemic episodes from under eating. So that low blood sugar is driving their average number down. And when I look at their glucose variation, their curves are up and down, up and down, up and down all day. And glycemic variability has been shown to be a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It increases inflammation, clot formation, all those bad things at the vascular level. And that's something we have to, so you, one of the numbers you got on your report card was glucose variability, right? Yeah. There's a percent of variation. Right. We don't know what the sweet spot number for optimal metabolic health is, but from my experience, keeping that below 15 to 20%, I think you were a single digits, you might've been like 9%, 9 something, yeah. which is great. you know. And if you look at your curve, the visual, again, you're gonna ex expect some fluctuations, but it's relatively like a flat line with very smooth bumps. Right. Where the other individuals, even though their average glucose is good, it swings up and down. And then I need to really address what can we do to stabilize that pattern? Because the other key pattern we see is we call them glucose dippers. And there's studies behind this where a lot of people dip in the afternoon, like they drop by 60 to 70 points after even not that high glycemic of a lunch. They go from like 130 to 70 or 60. Mm. And glucose dippers consistently are eating a lot more food the second half of the day. Like mid-afternoon, they come back, kids come back from school. They don't realize that it's dropping sugar that's making them cranky as heck. They're overeating and it just sets off this whole pattern. And if we can fix a few things about their eating, we can stabilize that. And people end up eating less and they lose weight as a result of that. So. You know, that is... 
absolutely fascinating because what I found, part of the reason I went to one meal a day is I found that if I ate a lunch or a breakfast, I was starving mm, yeah. later. And what I suspect is because the lunch and breakfast I used to eat was very high refined carbohydrates in the early days that I would get this like a, a spike and then the crash from the insulin and that insulin release was making me hungry right. later. And then I would overeat again. And then I would get the thing where you, you'd hit the wall during exercise. Totally. So you like literally run out of steam where you're like, you would kill someone for a banana, like murder them, <laughs> yeah, right. and, like that kind of thing. And yeah. I never get that now because I'm exercising on a fasted state. Yeah. Um, and I don't even get hungry when I'm exercising, but, but yeah, so it's really interesting and everybody's different, obviously. Yeah. So it's yeah. a really important point for some people, the breakfast skipping really helps them moderate their hunger. Like, just like you said, Others, I'll tell you, um, the, the breakfast skipping is causing them to eat erratically the second half of the day. Yeah. They're just eating and they're feasting way beyond dinner into the late hours. So yeah. it's just very complicated. So you got to understand your body, perform the experiments, but then just sort of see where you're at with this because there's so much variability with these different you know approaches. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, and yeah, and and what I did start to figure is that maybe eating a couple times a day, but having that first uh, meal not be a high glycemic meal. Yeah, uh, you seems... want to Z, you want to get that protein the first meal because one of the mm. things is when you get up in the morning in a fasted state. Yeah, the benefit of that is your catabolic to fat, which is great. We want to burn fat, right? Yeah. But you're also at a peak level of catabolic to catabolism to your muscle. So ah. you're very susceptible to losing muscle. And that's where you need to get the amino acid leucine into the body and like 30 grams of dairy or animal-based meat. You know, you got to make sure you're getting that dose into the system or really you're going to be kind of, you know, in a, in a debt when it comes to- where, where, where are eggs in that process? Yeah, eggs are yeah. great for leucine mm -hmm. as well too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so mm -hmm. absolutely. So so those are those are great things. And you know, some days I'm not hungry, I'll do a whey protein shake because whey is a great way to easily see, get I leucine. See, so see. I'll do with greens, a little bit of berries, yeah. a scoop of whey, a high quality whey protein, and I'm good to go. I'm not feeling that hungry. Sometimes I might have a boiled egg with it just to keep my stomach full. Yeah. But that's been kind of my go-to breakfast now, like by 10 a.m. I don't really, before I did do like 12, 1 p.m., but now, because I'm like all after seeing my DEXA scan and the data, I'm like, I got to make sure I'm getting enough muscle into the system. You know, not for cosmetic reasons, but for glucose clearance. For glucose reasons. clearance. Yeah. 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 Because cosmetically, you're perfect, right? Thank you so much. Well, yeah. but what Can else I show my abs right now? Or? <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Yeah. I, it, 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 if I lifted up my shirt, you would see an ab. That's what you would see. If, if you even saw that. <laughs> right, yeah. We're Indian, right? We got the Indian belly. So oh, you heck can't yeah, avoid dude. that. So. Hey, man. It's, right. but you know, the Buddha had it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got it too. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, so the the protein thing, that's a good teaching point for me because I have noticed that I've hit a wall in terms of being able to gain strength. Yeah. And even though I'll go to the gym and I'll do these things, I'll hang out with my friend, Dr. Harry, and we'll lift weights in his garage, like a couple of middle-aged, like and listening to <laughs> 80s rock. Perfect. And uh, talking about, you know, how, how you know, our, our hopes and dreams have never come to fruition, you know, standard, <laughs> standard yeah. middle-aged crisis yeah. stuff. And, um, and we've both been kind of hitting a bit of a wall and he's actually switched a little more to a plant-based thing because his, um, he has gout and some other things and, yeah. you know, and, totally. and, uh, but, but by the way, for you plant basers out there, one option is to take um, branch chain amino acids where you can get the leucine specifically. Mm. Um, so if you get an adequate dose of that, then you can at least activate some of that muscle activation. So, one of the greatest people to follow, and I think I was exposed to him, Don Lehman through Jerry Reven, who basically coined metabolic syndrome yeah. back in the years. And we, t we had a lot of discussions around protein intake because I told him, listen, um, these Asians have low amounts of muscle mass, their diets are low in protein. And he sort of got me into looking into more protein resources. And I I think he introduced me to Don Lehman. And interestingly, Peter Atia, I know, did um, a great podcast with Don Lehman as well, too. So Outstanding. really good resource to check out to really understand the science of protein and how it affects you, muscle growth. Yeah. You know, what's funny, it showed up in the lay, in my lay news feed on Apple News, a women's health article on protein. My wife just told me that exact, the funny thing, I don't know how it is with you and your wife, but I tell her this stuff. And until she like hears it from someone a else or reads it on Women's Health, they're it like, doesn't exist. did you know about this? I'm like, I told <laughs> you, it's in page 24 of my book. You know, you can read it if you want. But she's like, no, but Women's Health said, I'm like, whatever. People Magazine says, okay, bye. <laughs> and both our wives but are doctors, right? I totally, so they'd rather listen my to My wife sends me articles that like, I'm cited in and she doesn't even know it. <laughs> and she's like, well, this sounds like something you'd be interested. I'm like, I'm in it. Um, right, totally. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's a great. side comment, but yeah. It is, but it's also wives, entirely but yeah, yeah. true. Yeah, exactly. Right, it's like that episode of Key and Peele. Did you ever see it where, no. where uh, it's the, the two Key and Peele are talking about their wives and, their, and they're like, oh, they're all lovey-dovey in person. And then they get together and they're like, you know, and my wife said this and I was like, He's looking around to make sure he's not there. I was like, B word, I'm gonna tell you. And then like looking around and it just gets more extreme to where like they have to go into space to be able oh, to God. say. 
Oh my god! It's but no, it's, we we love our wives. <laughs> They're actually vastly our better halves. <laughs> totally. But um um so the protein piece, one one thing that I that that so you have the diet components, the, yeah. how it affects sleep, how sleep affects it. Yeah. One thing that blew my mind. So uh, this this was really interesting. So I I was scheduled after this meditation retreat. So I was blown open. Like I, there was no self, mm -hmm. like I was experiencing radiant present moment. You did not have your sense run, right? During that? No, I did okay, not. Okay, I, in okay. In fact, I came home yeah. and I was like, you know what? I need to do this thing Ron's been bullying me into doing. Like that's <laughs> right, what kind of finally right. snapped. Totally. And, uh, and so I think I'd emailed you. I'm like, okay, I'm good to go. Let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah. I finally like the universe was just telling me you got to do this. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I put the thing on and then I, I, I was scheduled to go do a talk for 1500 healthcare professionals for a company called Modernizing Medicine. They're a, they're a specially specific EHR. Yeah. I've spoken for them before years ago. And so I haven't done a lot of talks recently because I've kind of been very resistant internally yeah. because I'm like, is this really authentically what I want to do right now? Like mm -hmm. what I really want to talk about is like waking up and like all yeah, this other stuff. Totally. So I got on a call with the client and they were like, dude, you want to talk about meditation? Talk about meditation. Do you talk about anything you want? You have 1500 people here. We, we just believe that whatever your message is, it's appropriate for the audience. And I was like, what? So I was super excited, but then I go and I was going to perform a couple songs and do this whole thing. Yeah. And normally like you do these things enough, my mind has been conditioned to no longer have that real legit stage fright where you're mm -hmm. like, I'm going to, I'm totally going to fail. It's going to be a disaster. Yeah. Right? The mind knows that. Yeah. Body doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. So body is like, you're gonna die. <laughs> and um, you gotta talk for an hour to the 1500 people and you gotta sing songs and then you're gonna do a meditation. You're gonna do all this, like you're, you're, de you're dead. But so I, so I, before I go up, I'm in this meditative state and I'm like, dude, there's not even anybody doing this talk. It's just like universe talking to universe. That's how it felt. I go up, I do the thing, the glucose monitor is on, I'm fasted, yeah. right? So it's like a 1 PM Eastern and I haven't eaten anything. And my baseline sugar was around 90, 100. And um, I go do the talk and after the talk's over, and by the way, it's it goes great according to what they say, sure. right? And yeah. I felt good. I was like, yeah. I was in a flow state. Yeah. I do the songs, I do the meditation. The meditation was crazy. I go backstage and I look at my hand and it's doing this. Mm. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. So then I, I do the meet and greet and selfies and people are telling stories and it's just beautiful. It's moving, yeah. moving. Awesome. I look at my glucometer later. At the, at the CGM report. And I went from fasted 90 or whatever to 150 mm. during the talk. And it was like a slow, and then it come so down. So fascinating, yeah. And then a bit of a low ebb afterwards. Yeah. And where did that come from? It was right. all cortisol. It was all the body Amazing. keeping the store, score. Totally. We all know that intuitively. We've read the headline articles on Apple News about this, but until you see that data over and over, it's profound. And I've seen the same thing when I do public speaking gigs. And by the way, this is a good way to negotiate a higher speaking salary. So let them know that, you know, usually during talks, I'm pre-diabetic, tachycardic, and hypertensive. So I want to double my fee to $100 now. So yeah, yeah so, no, honestly, it is like, it's crazy Dude. what happens. Yeah. And so in our program, so one anecdote I'll share with you, which I actually blogged about was young woman in her thirties, rock stable glucose, like never above 120. Then she goes to dinner with her in-laws and they start talking about the COVID vaccine. And just during that argument, she went up to 174. Wow. Never seen anything like that. She wow. goes out because she knows my work. She does some breathing. She comes back in, they sort of make up, and then she has chocolate cake and it goes up to 125. So literally my title was, your in-laws can be more dangerous than chocolate cake. You know, so, <laughs> but you know, and I, now I give talks and they're titled emotional metabolism because I love showing people the specific data on what stress can do to you. And the mechanism is basically adrenaline going straight to the liver and causing it to release more glucose so you can flee or fight. So it's a physiological mechanism that's been de designed to protect us. But so many of us are living in that low level hypervigilant stress state and that can drive incredible glucose, you know, elevations. And, and I, I didn't, I always knew about this connection, but until I looked at people's glucose data, I tell people now we're the sensor. I'm not as worried about having microvascular complications from diabetes, et cetera. I've got my glucose under good control. For me, it's an indirect cortisol sensor because yeah. I'm very sensitive to these things. Yeah. And what you brought up about the emotional suppression is so important because many of my patients, both women and men, 
when they keep that emotion inside, it's like the outside, we can fool everybody. You and I look very calm right now, but your body, like I said, your body keeps score. It's amplified and magnified when it's inside. You're not releasing it through physical exercise or talk therapy, et cetera. And the nervous system, the endocrine system, everything just is in hyper mode. And the glucose is one way that you end up seeing that. So key point. Man, it's it's so important actually. And and Actually, that's almost the title of this show is why your in-laws can be more dangerous than chocolate cake, just like your blog, because <laughs> right. it is, it's yeah. emotional yeah. metabolism. Yeah. We're talking about all this wonky stuff with this thing and all that, but in reality, what we're doing is we're looking at the at the mind-body continuum, the biopsychosocial organism that's us, yeah. and going, okay, this is where the insights really happen because they can, it's a biofeedback mechanism, totally. right? Totally. So one of the interesting things that I gleaned from that event, so fine, okay, Z-Dog gets a little body stress when he's, when he's doing that. Mm -hmm. The difference between that and exercise stress yeah. is you're not opening up the skeletal muscle blood flow and sucking up that That's glucose and the peripheral resistance is still high. So I actually did an episode with, um, years ago with Edwards Life Sciences, and they had an intraoperative, non-invasive blood pressure probe that used optical and pressure sensor mm. on the finger. And the idea was they had an AI algorithm to predict uh, early on intraoperative hypotension because that's associated with bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. So they put the thing on me and we did a live show from their place in Orange County. And I mentally am like, this is great. I love this. This is so awesome. It's yeah. a sponsored show. I love the client. I love the yeah. guy who's teaching me here. This is wonderful. My body was saying something else. The, the, the blood pressure they were measuring was 210 over 120 during wow. the show. And in fact, the guy who was running it, the tech who was running it almost interrupted the show to say, you're gonna have a stroke. Wow. And and the thing is, we don't have a actual intra-arterial yeah. to correlate. So it's yeah. probably overestimating, sure. it tends to overestimate. Sure. But I could tell you that after the show, I always have a little bit of a headache and I always mm -hmm. attribute it to just the intensity of the moment. Yeah. But no doubt, dude, the body is keeping yeah. track. But the key thing you brought up, so, so the nice thing, just like exercise, we know when we exercise, heart rate's up, blood pressure's up, like all the physiological hallmarks are basically in the red zone. Right. But we know the after effect of that is gonna be amazing, right? So that's, that's why right. we do it. But I would say with your event too, um, so the difference with me is when I have events like that, the positive emotions that are around that, right? The collaboration, yeah. that yeah. sense of purpose is huge. But the difference for me now is before I do a talk like that at 12 p.m. at a high-tech company, I'd rush back to the office seeing patients oh. without even skipping a beat. Yeah. But then I learned very early on that, you know what? I'm gonna keep an hour break. I'm gonna chill out in the car for you can take a nap or I'm gonna go for a walk. It's like finding those spaces to let out steam is so critical, you know? But otherwise, you know, you you definitely wanna embrace those opportunities to get the adrenaline up and get the crowd fired up. But then I know now that I've gotta give myself, like I tell my wife, listen, no social stuff this weekend. Yeah. I've got a Z-Dog interview, whatever, you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I've gotta calm down. I need, right, I need to right, chill out for three right. days. But, but really finding those spaces is so key. And for me, actually, I'll tell you, even though I was studying for the boards, I made a very conscious decision. So one thing I found when I was studying for the boards is my memory's gone to hell, you know, mm. like compared to when I was retaining information before. Oh, and I just decided, I, I decided that, you know what? I need to stop. Like I, I was off social media almost 99%. Good. I wasn't looking at news. And it's like my memory over a few weeks, like so came back. It was like incredible. Up. But at the same time, because I was just looking at paper books and going to libraries and not looking at social media, I was exercising about the same amount, but I had some of the best CGM averages, like average glucose 85, you know? Wow. And I've exercised way more before that, but it just kind of told me that even this stuff that we do with our phones, it seems so habitual our nervous system is still like, what the hell are you doing to me right now? Absolutely. It is like, what are you doing to me? Absolutely. Like even Instagram, like, you know, I put stuff on Instagram, but then before I know it, I'm like, oh, he's got another Vader video. I got to watch that. You know, it's like, <laughs> I can't say no to your Vader video. Oh, even no though there's sometimes- can. Even Vader can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a dark side for me. I give, But you know, it's just, it, it, it's amazing. It just makes you rethink the world we live in and how we've got to kind of create these spaces to, you know, provide a break. Otherwise Man. we end up paying a price. Man, it's, yeah. a, it's absolutely true. Yeah. And, and you can get some other insights. Like I realized- that when I come back, so what you said about taking a space after those things for connection and all that, at this last event, I had that because they did a meet and greet where nice. people came and they just said, told me the most beautiful, just moving things. Yeah. In fact, I, I got one of them on video because my wife was texting me at the same time going, hey, how was your talk? Which is yeah. the standard. And I was yeah. always like, yeah, whatever. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> because there's a feeling in the body that like that took a toll. Yeah. And there's also this like self-critical voice that's like, I could have done this different. I forgot to say this. Totally. I screwed up that note on the song. I did this, I did that. And this time I was like, I was primed to kind of go, wait, but what? 
what's really going on? And seeing the glucose made me realize, okay, the body is still tense. And then talking to the people was like, but this is the mission. This is the connection. This is the joy of this yeah. thing. And you just realize, oh, I've been resistant to doing talks because I was, I was, the, the mind was telling stories, listening to the feedback of the body going, mm. you know, you shouldn't be doing this. So and here's all the yeah. reasons why. <laughs> right, and, totally. and now it's just kind of transformed my thinking and, and getting off social media, not using Twitter, those kind of yeah. things. There are massive releases. Huge, totally. Huge releases. <laughs> so, so this thing, you know, we started talking about all, you know, there's health benefits, right? Cause you wanna reduce insulin. Um, you wanna improve insulin sensitivity, reduce glucose variability, yep. reduce, and, but it really evolves into the whole mind, body, biopsychosocial entity yeah. benefits from understanding itself better. So true. Awareness. And you know, again, to sort of um, think about what we talked about in the beginning, these sort of scary stats on heart disease, um, like we talked about, we just don't have the right tools in place. You know, when I see patients come to my clinic and the last few months have been just horrendous in terms of high risk young people coming in with cardiovascular disease. Mm. One of the exercises I do with my 40 year olds is I actually put their numbers into a Framingham risk calculator to see what their risk would have been like oh, 10 years ago. Yeah. And over and over, what we see is the risk is like 1.5%. It's less than 3%. And so these risk calculators that we use, they really don't predict they, they don't all predict. of these other factors that raise heart disease you know, you know, risk. And to give you an example, the, the risk calculators, they don't include tri triglycerides. And I said, that's a key part of insulin resistance. They don't include waist circumference, right? Mm -hmm. um, many of them don't even include family history. They have nothing about stress on there, right? And then even just cardiovascular function, like what's your VO2 max or what's your resting heart rate, what's your heart rate response to exercise. These are key heart disease risk factors. And sometimes our patients are getting these tools and being thought that, you know, I'm probably decent. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. okay. I don't need to make changes at all. So we've got to think, like you said, much more holistically about disease, heart disease risk, all these factors, and not just those few criteria that we're plugging into a calculator. And then that's right brain medicine. That's right, right brain actually, medicine. I, let, me, let me clarify that. Yeah. That's right brain, left brain, corpus callosum yeah. engaged synergy. Yeah. That's what it is. You're taking these measurements, but you're putting them in context and you're putting them in context of the whole organism. Yeah. And one thing I wanna mention is, and I think Vinay on our show was really kind of talking about this, like there is, there's an ability of a person through delusion to take this data and misreact. Mm -hmm. And we talked about it, right? Yep. Like you see a bowl of fruit makes you your sugar totally. jump, but you don't see the bigger picture of the bowl of fruit and, or the neurosis around managing the blood sugar now mm -hmm. as another control aspect that you want. You yeah. want that control yep. instead of going, okay, I, under, I have an insight now, mm -hmm. I have a knowledge of, myself that I can see that these things are harmful maybe for me and these things may be less harmful or I've got gained an insight about yeah. even like my the whole speaking thing like I've gained an insight here that I didn't have it's true yeah which now means I'm going to do the type of talks that I think are going to help other people and mm -hmm. and you know the profound insight that you get yeah. from the meditate from the meditation thing <laughs> right. is there's no one doing that talk in other words the self that you think is there putting itself on the line that has everything to lose by standing in front of a tribe of people and potentially being excommunicated from the tribe, <laughs> right. that self doesn't exist mm -hmm. <laughs> in the, say, the way that we think. And yeah. when that's really seen, then it's like, oh, it's just a flow state. Yeah, so but, true. but that's a side. <laughs> <laughs> it's an important side note though. Yeah, sure. it's, it's also a deep taboo actually to even talk about stuff like that because it is a taboo in human society to question our fundamental identity. Yeah. Yeah, which is which I did on stage. And maybe that was part of the reason I had a bit of a cortisol yeah. response too. Yeah. yeah, that was kind of a breakthrough moment for you doing that. So, yeah, I've never yeah, done yeah, that in it, public. It's so, quite yeah. scary. You have 1500 <laughs> right. people closing their eyes yeah, and you're totally. pointing at like what they are. You're going, okay, now okay. drop into this, drop into And now you're officially diabetic. Great, great job. <laughs> Right. So, That's yeah. why all the gurus die young. <laughs> right, exactly. They're all missing limbs. Yeah, totally. They're blind. Except the ones in the Himalayas who've chosen not to interact with society. They live to be 150. They nailed so, it. Yeah. They That's, nailed why they it. That's why they have monasteries. That's why they have monasteries. And they're you can Black. violate yeah, all totally. the taboo you want. You can fart while you're meditating. You can you know, question identity. Nobody cares. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so... With your patients now, you're learning more and more about kind of how to how to understand these data sets. Are there other things you're seeing in 
data patterns with CGM that have been transformative in how you care for them? Yeah. They so care for we, 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 I think we hit the big ones. You know, with the exercise is really not having, we've talked about this before, but let's tie glucose into it. Not having the all or nothing approach to exercise. You know, mm. either I'm going to go crazy and do boot camp or run a, you know, a half marathon, or I'm just going to sit for hour after hour. So a couple of things I want to redefine is many of my tech patients come in and talk to me and they're like, you're going to be proud of me because I got a standing workstation. I'm like, great. But I tell them that, you know, the difference between sitting and standing still is about 60 to 80 calories, maybe. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're not going to improve your metabolism by doing that. Right. So I'd even like the word sedentary. I just say stationary behavior is what we want to avoid. I see. So you're better off going from sitting to standing, to walking, to fidgeting, to doing whatever you can to keep that body moving is really key. And Mm -hmm. you see that with the glucose sensor is that just pacing back and forth a little bit, going for a 10 minute walk here, et cetera, they can really have significant shifts in your glucose patterns just from doing that. By the way, I got to tell you, there was a fascinating study that was all over the news. I don't know if you heard about this, about this exercise called the Soleus push-up. No. You know about this? Okay, so what they did at the University of Houston is they basically did glucose tolerance tests on individuals, and they hooked up these electrodes to their calves, and they had them do an exercise called the Soleus push-up, where they're sitting, and they're just lifting their heel up and keeping the toes on the ground. And what they found was these individuals, after doing that, basically their um, glucose was going down by, like, 50%, 47 to 50%, triglycerides dropping like crazy, using significantly less amounts of insulin. And the physiology physiology behind that is your soleus muscle is just 1% of your total body mass or your muscle mass, but it clears glucose at an incredible rate because it doesn't usually use glycogen. It just it's, it's a workhorse. It basically just clears glucose and fat in a regular level. It's wow. like incredible. It's your so calf muscle. It's, it's your calf, basically. Yeah, the back, the calf muscle, the soleus. So the way you activate that is if you're seated, I've been doing this the whole time. You don't know this under the table. I've been doing soleus you, pushups. So, yeah. Bro, you don't want to know what I've been doing <laughs> under the table. You can't see my hands right now. I'm glad you turned that camera off. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so the under yeah. table yeah, cam. The under table <laughs> cam. <laughs> That's not creepy. Yeah. That's not Ooh. creepy. Yeah, but uh, even so you've been simple doing things yeah. like doing toe walks, like you're walking to the kitchen and back with your knees, like you're just walking on your toes, or you're doing wall toe raises, just simple exercises like that. And you can see improvements in glucose. And again, you don't want to hack the system by just sitting for 18 hours and, and just doing, doing toe raises. Yeah. It's just like when people say, oh, hand grip. It's related to longevity. So I'm just going to sit and watch a Netflix with. Yeah. Yeah. But that's basically exactly. I mean, these are people that lifted heavy weights. They had a total body effect from this. This actually, think I think it explains why walkers do so well. Yes. Because when you're walking, you're activating the soleus. And one other thing, this really ties it in well for me, is I noticed in my practice that a lot of my really heavy, overweight folks that are over 30 to 40 pounds above their ideal body mass, many of them that are physically active have really big calves, muscular calves, because they're carrying on this weight all the time. And when I look at their labs, their glucose and lipid numbers are almost, they're remarkable. Like they're always really normal. You know, they don't really affect, they might be hypertensive or they might have other issues going on. But now it kind of explains to me the fact that they are activating their soleus like crazy. So those of you that are overweight, just walking, walk on your toes, just just walk and you walk and you're going to have amazing glucose and triglyceride clearance. You don't have to, because a lot of my patients think that they have to do boot camp or they have to train for half marathon. What happens? They get injured, right? Yeah. Because our exercise society is so type A that you've got to do this, you've got to do this exercise. Or they're racing their cortisol from- Racing their cortisol from Overstressing, exactly. But just walking is just amazing. You know, activate that soleus and you're clearing glucose and lipids like crazy. Everything you just said is so important, man. Like that's gonna be so helpful to so many people. And there's so many like say nurses in our audience who are somewhat overweight and they're just like, what? I don't even have time to do it. They're walking around the wards on their tiptoes now. Yeah. Or they're doing those when they're standing in the patient room. Or when they're charting. Or they're charting. So I've got a term like- At the cow. (laughs) Totally. So I have a program I'm I'm writing. I call it the meta program pre Mark Zuckerberg, but I I have something (laughs) called Epic Workouts. And they're basically how you chart on Epic while you're like, right? So so doing like exercises to clear, because believe Believe me, I have a growing number of physicians in my metabolic lifestyle practice now because of all the stress they're facing. You know, doctors are not always the best at long lifestyle recommendations, <laughs> right? Sometimes it's-, it's, it's I mean, I smoke three extreme. packs a day while um, sitting all I'm day. I'm glad you cut it in half though. So it's, 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 the, those, those retreats are helping. Well, listen, listen, listen. Yeah, totally. I keep my weight under control with a variety of modalities. One of them is six pack a day smoking habit. There we go, nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep, totally. Smoke yourself thin. 
<laughs> yeah. But no, if we can get a little bit creative, you know, I'm not rejecting the modern lifestyle, but there are ways that we can sort of hack the system during those times that you absolutely can't go out and do exercise, right? Mm. So if you can do that, and then when you get back to, you know, home, weekends, you got some time, then go out and get a real workout in. Don't just be sitting with a hand grip and, you know, doing seated calf raises. So, right, know, right. Yeah. And, you know, so one thing I did notice, this is an interesting pattern. My wife and I both, no, both noticed this. It was Thanksgiving was over the time that we had the CGM. Mm-hmm. And, and we would take these walks together um, on our, there's a cross country trail by our house. And so it may be like an hour where you're just walking mostly flat. Yeah. And what we found is both of our glucose is just- Amazing, right? Amazing. Totally. Whereas I'll go to the gym, lift weights, go on a Stairmaster hard, like mm-hmm. all this stuff, glucose hardly budges. Yep. And um, it's really interesting just walking. Yeah, totally. Yeah, engaging Because it's that. the right balance. And the reason for that is when you're doing high intensity stuff, what are you doing? You're spiking cortisol again, right? Yeah, exactly. But it's not necessarily negative because during the workout, you There's want that benefit. glucose to go to your muscles that's and right. power that workout. That's right. Um, but, but that's the sweet spot of like a lot of exercise and cardio I do is in that 180 minus age zone. We've mm, talked about it before, but that's, that's right. the mafetone aerobic zone. Mm-hmm. Most of my patients are doing a ton of anaerobic and they don't realize that that's driving a lot of hyperglycemia, a lot of hunger. They're over depleting their glycogen stores. That's not something we want to do. Mm. But that sweet spot exercise, you're burning fat, you're not stressing cortisol, and your hunger is much more stable, energy is more stable. It's like a gift just doing that zone four or five days a week and just walks. When you look at the CGM data, you're like, wow, this is all I need to do is, you know, to really keep glucose stable. To keep it stable. Yeah. And so the goals with the glucose monitor then, if you're looking, say, at my data, would be what? Like reduce glucose variability? uh, I think your variability looks great. Okay. Uh, Honestly, I mean, I think all your numbers are well within range. I'm kind of thinking of the future. I think your average came in at like 105, yeah. you know, which is fine. I mean, but I do think that um, if you change your target range, so the target range I kind of set for each individual, a diabetic, I'm not going to put them between 70 to 120. Yeah. I first just want them to get 10, 15% improvement at where they're at. Right. But you were between 70 to 140. You did well with your time and target, but I would nudge you a little bit to try 70 to 120 yeah. and just sort of see where you're at with that. And I think you can easily get your average glucose down to like 95 to hundred or in the nineties. I think that'd be our first goal is let's see if we can go there. And I'm thinking more prospectively because I know as we age, insulin resistance does naturally get a little bit worse. We try to stay ahead of that as much as possible. Yeah. But with you really, I'm micromanaging. I kind of joke with you, I'm being an Indian dad. I yeah. want you to get an A plus instead of an A minus. Yeah, so. yeah, I, 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 I sent you the report and I was like, he's going to be very proud, very proud. Right. And he's like, yeah, okay. You know what I would do? I'd narrow the range. I really want to get you. And, and, and he's like, I'm sorry, I'm being an Indian dad. I'm like, I love it. It's exactly what I want. I love it. Yeah, I love totally. it. Yeah, no, it's great. And yeah. and again, like look at the kind of psychology behind it too. Yeah. Like I'm looking at diet a little differently. I'm thinking now about protein after you talked about that, yeah. looking at exercise different. And this is a conversation with a lifestyle medicine physician. No, totally. I feel better talking to you. Like even before we started, I was telling you about some experience I was having and you're like, you know, I'm really glad you're working on that. I think that's really important. And yeah. I'm like, I feel better. I feel like someone's witnessing what I'm going through and I have an ally and, and yeah. that's the therapeutic alliance. That's right. Yeah. And that itself probably lowered my sugar. Actually, I should look at what my- Oh yeah, you yeah, got, got it. Yeah, I got it we on now. Done it right I showed, peak, yeah. I, let me show the people. Although, yeah, you. it'd be interesting to see- <gasps> It's 89. This. Look at that, fantastic. Take a look. So uh-huh. this is what it looks like. And you can see the awesome. chart. I woke up and it's higher yeah. at fasting and then it just has been declining. Oh, What's and your now, Venmo? I'm gonna send you a big bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, totally. and I'll send you my insurance, which won't cover it, and I have a high deductible plan. Right. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is this that's is awesome. This is that's really good. cool. Yeah, because honestly, when I'm doing speaking about my glucose, does definitely my heart rate. Like that's the most sensitive indicator. Yeah. But but glucose de- does tend to run a little bit higher. Yeah. So I'm curious. So full thinking. authenticity. Does yeah. this kind of interview cause that kind of response in you? Are you stressed when you do these kind of things? Like. How's it I mean, feel? I've known you for a long time. A long and time. to me, like the stress is just a positive. Like I want to yeah. feel some of that yeah. because like your audience is incredible and I want to just put all, I want to go all in, right? I want to make sure and, they get everything possible and benefit. And they always love when possible. you show up, man. No, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that kind of, po- see, that's the thing we should distinguish between. Yeah. Like if you feel nothing, it's kind of like, hmm, there is a kind of positive stress response. Yeah. You know, then that's been talked about by Stanford people and others. Sure. And uh, I do, I do, I'm trying to reframe my experience speaking because, you know, again, it's like, it's so crazy. It's so weird, Ron. Like I would get, I would do these things and I would get all this validation, meaning yeah. everything your Indian dad would want. <laughs> You'd get money. Mm-hmm. 
and, and they pay pretty well because you yeah. keep ratcheting up the demand because yeah. you're like, oh, no, now I'm going to die, right? Yeah, right. And, and, and like <laughs> right. Exactly. About, exactly yeah. And you get validation from the audience because they'll say these wonderful things and they'll really move you with their own stories. And yeah. suddenly you realize it's not about you at all. It's about them. So all this great stuff. And yet my mind will say, this is, I can't, I mustn't do this anymore. Like, yeah. There's something really, and then you start to get the insight into what that whole thing is. And it really is all these things kind of tying together totally. that allow you to look inwards again. And, and okay, last thing I want to say about this, you brought it up yeah. and, and it's like, a, it's, it's become like a, a crusade of mine, mm -hmm. which is emotional repression. Mm. So we are in a pandemic of emotional repression. Mm -hmm. It's like, we've, we don't, and, and even repression, even maybe not the right word, because that implies a kind of an intentionality. It's an emotional avoidance. Mm -hmm. We we feel an energy of emotion and immediately there's a thought cascade that says, okay, this is an uncomfortable emotion. Therefore, let me escape into thought, tell stories about it, repress, deny, project, escape into a projection or a memory. Yeah. And this manifests in the body because mm -hmm. emotion is energy in motion. And when you, bottle it up, it, it shows up. Yeah. So you can you can you can actually <laughs> feel emotion in yeah. its raw way without hurting yourself. In yeah. fact, it's a kind of a liberation. So true. You know, so so my big rewarding event recently was every year I would go to Arizona and I'd do a three day retreat for families with von Willebrand's disease, which is a severe bleeding disorder. Wow. And, the, and it's, it's, and so finally I got to do this a few weeks ago in Phoenix, Arizona. It's an incredible group of people, but we were having this exact same discussion and people are telling me like, how do we sort of get out of the cycle? And I, I know you've got so many approaches, but I, I literally went through the exercise of having them watch those emotions in the observer mode. But the way I sort of had them do the exercise was I had them close their eyes. I said, okay, so now close your eyes. You've got a flat screen on your forehead, which is your TV screen. And I want you to just watch those movies right now. And, you know, and then we kind of talked about the different movies that people were watching. And I kind of told them that, listen, when you guys were watching Netflix, would you want to watch a movie about a family where everything is going great and there's no drama at all? That'd be boring, right? Um, but when you watch your own life, there's a lot of excitement and drama. And if you watch it as an outsider, you're like, I'm living a pretty interesting life, right? So, and if you watch it as an observer, it's just it's just a different experience because now you're outside of that head. You're watching the movie. You've uncoupled yourself from being just an active player where you're just unconscious of that situation. And the interesting thing is about six to seven people in the room when they did the exercise, they said, you know what? When you had me look at that movie, I didn't see anything. I was like, well, welcome. You're a Buddha. You were able to blank your mind. People say it's impossible to blank your mind, but when you actually do an exercise like that and you're actually now putting the ego under a projection light, a spotlight, the ego gets very threatened because now it understands that it's being watched, it's being questioned, right? So it's a super powerful thing, but um, just maybe a tip for, I, I know you've got very woke listeners, but but this is something that helps me a lot because at night, by, by the way, one thing I want to add, because I have so many people with sleep issues is those thoughts, they get magnified at nighttime like nobody's business. Like it might be a simple thing, like I had a conflict at work with my manager, but when you're sleeping in bed alone in darkness and you're isolated, that same thought turns into a monster movie, right? Your manager looks like a serial killer and the imagination, the REM phase sleep, all that stuff just makes it so much more difficult, which is why it's important for you to have that runway process where you offload those thoughts, you do some calming actions, have some gratitude thoughts. Studies show that gratitude practice before bedtime actually improves sleep quality and your mood the day afterwards, you know? So dosing that gratitude in the evening is key, but just for your woke listeners out there, just a couple of closing tips for them to follow. Man, they're awoke, not just straight woke. <laughs> <laughs> right, totally, big time. Listen, yeah. man, you're preaching to the choir. Everything you just said is so beautifully said. I mean, the fact that, okay, that, that, that you did that exercise with people and they got out of it exactly what you were pointing at, which is, yeah. whoa, look for what's looking, what's living, what's looking through your eyes and living this life that you think is, you know, you behind your head running the dials and right. stressing. And when you're at night, when there's no distraction and the thought storm is just going, what happens when you actually realize that, hey, where is the thought? Where are those thoughts coming from? What's even looking at the thoughts? And you realize the same stuff the thoughts are made of is, is actually what's awake and looking. And then suddenly the, the play is different. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you're you're in the play, but not of the play. Yeah. Uh, and it, it just transforms everything. And sometimes 
feeling those raw emotions happens much more easily after an awakening, a shift in identity where, and, and, and because you have no choice, like the, the things are just coming up and you no longer have a place to hide. Mm -hmm. But even before like that, like the other day I was watching the show, um, uh, the White Lotus on HBO, mm, and it's yeah. it, each season. I read is, the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, the first yeah. season was all about like race and class, and the second season is all about masculinity. Mm. So these guys are having a conversation around a table. It's a guy from The Sopranos mm -hmm. and his dad, who's like in his eighties, and he's talking about intimacy and how you treat women and all this other stuff. And and I'm having these these thoughts going, analyzing the conversation. Oh, it's interesting. This is generational trauma and how the next generation's a little bit better and the next is better, but are they really better because they're still quite masculine? And I realized because of this practice of awareness, I was like, well, look at all these thoughts. What are they, what mm. are they, what are they avoiding? Like what's going on in the body right now? Like yeah. what, what am I, am I feeling something that I'm not paying attention to? And I dropped attention into the, this sort of space and I was feeling an emotion that I couldn't figure out what it was. Interesting. Yeah. So I just dived into that. What's this emotion? And suddenly I was just that emotion. Yeah. Tears are coming out. I'm just watching a freaking show <laughs> and uh, nobody was there thankfully, yeah. but, it, and, and then it just passed like a rain shower that comes Beautiful. in. There's just pavement and oh, it's, it's so just important to release that stuff. Beautiful. My God, yeah. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to yeah. go, oh, it was about intimacy. No, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. It was about an emotion that wasn't totally. allowed to be felt oh my and thought was spinning. It's so agree. It's, 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 um, there are songs that I listened to growing up and now I hear them and I, I don't even, like I just used to consciously suppress the emotions, but I hear the song, I'm like, I'm letting it go, man. Dude. It's like, like music and certain movies, just, Absolutely. you know, just let it flow, man. All let you repressors go. out there, just please, just let it go. <laughs> Especially guys, guys, guys are, absolutely. but you know, women, guys do and Asian females. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, a lot of females, right? So yeah, that's my sort of new practice Actually, is Asian females with less muscle mass and emotional suppression. And yeah, you know, you my specialty. You, you, no, you're, you're a, not no, joking. It's a big issue. It's, it's a, a big huge issue. issue. Big issue. It, it, yeah. It's like, it's almost like, you know, my wife and I were talking about this, almost like you know, the role of the Asian females to hold things together, totally. to push down those feelings. It's because a generational they, thing. It's yeah, a generational yeah. thing. And it feels like those feelings are unbearable in a way, like they could kill you. Yeah. There's, and that's the ego again. Yeah, it's the totally. ego going, yeah, no, you can't bear this. Yeah. Like you need to hold things together. You're the yeah. source of stability. You're the peacemaker. You're all that other stuff. Oh, totally. And if you just let, it, let those in a crack, you're gonna be incapacitated. Yeah. Yeah. And the truth is actually the opposite. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. by the way, that 45 to 64 year old age group that I say where heart disease death is rising, the fastest growth in that demographic is women, women. actually, yeah. right? And we see what women do, right? I mean, basically they've got the same ambitious goals with work. They haven't stepped off the gas pedal when it comes to home. And these things are really coming to a head right now. And, and my biggest fear too, again, because I am seeing some teens, I do some programs at schools. When we look at 45 to 64, mm -hmm. these are still people that grew up in the pre-smartphone generation. So yeah. we still rode our bikes, we swam, yeah. we were outdoors. I'm really scared about the future because what's going to happen with this generation of kids that are showing up in my clinic with type 2 diabetes and now I'm seeing hypertension in teenagers, which I'd never see, when is their arterial event going to happen? You know, oh, 30s, I mean, oh like we God. never thought of 40s. So, so even... you as parents, please, you know, is, um, just, just really pay attention to these trends and get ahead of that curve. It didn't even occur to me because I talk a lot about the crisis of mental um, health issues in kids that I think are driven by all the things that we talk about, right. social media, all the things. Um, how would that manifest in terms of these diseases? Of totally. course it's gonna manifest. There's, yeah. It's just exposure time, right? I mean, if you're getting exposed to the foods Absolutely. and the emotions and the sedentary behavior, all it's the stuff. It's a ticking stuff, time bomb. It is a ticking time bomb. And in bomb, fact, you so. look at kids now, they, they're less likely to go out and take risks. They're less likely to yeah. have a lot of sex as in high school. Oh, they're totally. less likely to drink and do drugs. Yeah. But what are they more likely to do? Sit at home. That's right. In front of the thing, on, yeah. in front of a screen, yeah. getting FOMO, yeah. raising their cortisol. Yeah, totally. And by the way, for you teens out there, I'd be doing the exact same thing. Totally. <laughs> right, right, totally. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, yeah, actually exactly. Think, I, I actually yeah. think Gen Z in many levels is yeah. vastly superior to our generation oh, completely they are agree. more uh, they're they have more capacity they're smarter yeah. they're oh, more yeah. connected they're yeah. more they're less prejudiced like all these totally, wonderful totally, things totally. we've just poisoned them yeah with this with this stuff yeah so you know unlike millennials that are just pieces of crap i mean <laughs> here we go oh god here we go <laughs> nice i'm joking yeah, i'm right. joking um yeah so so yeah it, it is, it is this, that's actually a key thing. Would yeah. you, do you do, would you do CGM with a teen? <laughs> I think, 
teens that are at risk, you know, they're already, they love consuming technology. And I, I think, why not? You know, yeah. and um, I've had some parents ask me about that. I haven't done that formally yet, um, but but I, I think absolutely. You know, yeah. I, you know, again, with the right supervision, the right counseling with parental support, so they learn the lessons. I will tell you, after wearing these sensors, I've learned my lessons and I take a lot of sensor holidays. Yeah. You know, studies show that even for sleep, for example, people that track sleep obsessively, yeah. they have worse insomnia. They, they have worse insomnia, right? So that's the Heisenberg happens. uncertainty principle. By measuring exactly it, you've altered it. Right. Because yeah. again, you talk a lot um, about intuition. It does blunt intuition quite a bit, right? If you're completely oh, dependent on it. So, so like you said, learn the lessons, maybe wear it for a month or two, and then get off and just lead your life freely. Yeah. And then if you go off the handles because of a stressful event or holiday season, et cetera, training wheels, put them back on, Brilliant. reset course, take it off. Some people- I think Peter as well, too. They have it sewed to their body and they're wearing yeah. it 24-7. Peter, Peter's got a <laughs> right, bandolero so. <laughs> of glucose monitors and right. he's checking his blood himself. Yeah, totally. And yeah. yeah. Dude, it was so funny to watch him finger sticking, you know, Thor. Oh, wow. And yeah. uh, and telling him, oh, your, watch now. your ketone level is this and, you know, you need to be at this. And, you know, Thor's totally. like, Peter promised me <laughs> that uh, four days into the fast, I'd have, you know, clairvoyance. <laughs> Right. Instead, I feel like shit. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's actually another one. I keep saying one last good point, but this is really important. Dude, there's, there's a lot of my female patients. They're following influencer that are influencers that are, that are male muscular folks with uh, very different metab metabolisms, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. for them, one meal a day might work. Fasting restrictively might work. Some of these things might work. But, you know, for women especially, I've seen over fasting can lead to thyroid dysfunction, mm. hormonal fluctuations, just a lot of different things. I'm mm. not knocking fasting, but again, with gender, with individuals, mm. there's a lot of different things. And a lot of my women, I've just had to say, listen, we are going to cut the fasting right now. Mm. You've got to get back into more of a balanced eating plan, more protein, and they feel so much better. And then when they're stronger, the metabolism is better. We're like, you know, now we can maybe do two meals a day. You've earned the right to fast. But when you start fasting right off the bat with already all those issues happening, it can often backfire. So, that is really yeah. useful. Yeah. yeah. Because, uh, and again, there's no one size fits all too. Right. That's the yeah. thing. And, and the gender difference is, is, is a, uh, or the sex difference. I don't know. What is it now? Gender or sex? I can't. Uh, I'll let you answer that. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so you, you, that's on, how you deflect the cancellation. The yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, right, totally. Well, you know, on according, that note, yeah, yeah. Exactly. let's go back to gluconeogenesis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally, all right. <laughs> You right, know what? So. No, why, why keep it? Why yeah. keep it that high level? Let's go to let's go to pyruvate dehydroxinase. Let's go totally. right to the Krebs cycle. Totally. How By the way, ATP? can I put in a plug? Please, because I love talking about that stuff. So yes. I do have a podcast called Meta Health. Oh gosh. So if you want to be nerdy and just learn metabolic physiology, but also practical stuff, I haven't done it in a few months because of the boards. But I'm going to get back into it. But it's been really rewarding. I have patients coming in, they know about pyruvate and acetyl CoA. Oh, dude, that's awesome. And it's, it's amazing. So it's a lot of fun. So if you want to check out, it's called Meta Health. You're really amazing, actually. Like oh, people that. don't realize, like, because you, you know, f when I knew you back at at the clinic when we were in the same yeah. clinic together, yeah. I was like, yeah, Ron's just another intern. Before you broke super free. nice guy. Before, no, yeah, yeah, right, before totally. I broke bad. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. I have some blue meth if you're interested. Yeah, right. Talk about raising your glucose, like methamphetamine. Oh my goodness. Yeah, gosh. right. Yeah, yeah right. I, oh, I bet. I imagine people who uh, abuse substances, you can see patterns too. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, by the way, That's what's, a your, show. what's your experience of alcohol and oh, uh, CGM? Yeah. A lot of hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia, sure. yeah, hypo. yeah. So with alcohol, it's very, because a lot of people are like, ooh, I'm having a keto-friendly cocktail. You know, it's not raising yeah. my glucose. But again, it's my whole message about you can't just look at the short-term data. Yeah. There's foods that you can put in your body that are not going to raise your sugar. Right. And they can kill you. They're like, poisonous. Right, right, they're poisonous. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly, right? <laughs> right. So with alcohol, number one, it can cause glucose instability. It wrecks your sleep. You can get more hypoglycemic episodes. But again, it's also driving increased fat generation in the liver, which is one of the underlying root causes for insulin resistance. I'm not knocking alcohol together, but some people just feel like it's safe for me to drink every day, you know, because yeah. my glucose isn't spiking. So, so don't let the CGM be a complete moniker of what you can and can't consume. There's other physiology involved in the body right. outside of glucose. And, and so, for me, I yeah. stopped drinking any alcohol actually in general, yeah. not because I don't love it. And I think it's a great yeah. social thing and, but because it was disrupting my sleep. Yeah. It and, has a major depressant. Like I will pay the price the next day. I yeah. get very sad the next day too. Yeah, yeah. So that too. So yeah, yeah emotional. 95% done with it as well, too. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. That, it's that 5% yeah. that makes it fun. Though. It is. And which reminds me, you, me, the wives need to go and have dinner. That'd be awesome. And Let's maybe a it. drink, a yeah. drink. Yeah. Love that, love that. That'd be Let's great. We'll, yeah. wear some, we'll wear the CGM we and totally you will. walk us through it. I'll get my <laughs> right. free consult out of it. I'll even, I'll even pay oh for dinner. God. You know, I have it. some friends, I just have to say that they, they like- 
us showing up in a parking lot. I bring them samples of sensors and they call it the penetration party. It's like so seedy. There's like, we're in a parking lot and like, there's like this flashing light and I'm like giving them sensors. I'm like, this just does not look right. But they're like, Ron, we're due for a penetration dude, party. I'm like, dude, oh my God. My reputation's is, going out the window. You broke it. bad just like me, man. Right yeah, that's amazing. Me. Something about you brings it out, it man. It just does. It right. just does. I, I've had, you know, and it's funny, like, uh, you know, people, people will be, I'll save that story for another time. <laughs> yeah. But I was gonna say, I finished the, to wrap around, like when, yeah. when I knew you at the clinic, I didn't know you did all this stuff or maybe you were just starting. Yeah. And I was like, Ron's just a real nice guy, internist. I occasionally admitted some of your I was patients. too busy emotionally suppressing, so you couldn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> right, Dude, so. at that time, when I was at the clinic Ooh, in Stanford, boy. Oh boy. Emotional repression was the only way I got through my day. Well, that's what medical training teaches you, right? It really does. So it's crazy. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Robbie Pearl, former CEO of Kaiser Permanent, the Kaiser Group, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's been on my show. He wrote a book about this called Uncaring About the Culture of Medicine, How mm. Emotional Repression, Denial, Projection yeah. is Our Training. Yeah. And it gets us through a lot of things. Yeah, and it's sure. actually adaptive in many ways, but now it's coming back to bite us yeah. because you know we're just unable to- you It's hard to just turn the switch on and off like yeah, a dial. Like, absolutely. let me go home and I'll release and I'll go to work and I'll turn it off. I mean, that has an impact, right? You can't we're not machines Absolutely. where we can turn it on and And it's so. another thing that like, it goes back to something we were talking about before the show that I think it relates to this, which is our conditioning yeah. is our series. It's all it's like karma, right? If you're if you're Hindu or or Buddhist, yeah. karma is just causes and conditions that lead to this point. Well, we're surrounded by it. Our education, our training, our medical school, our culture, not, family, culture, all that stuff. Family, yeah, religion, totally. all of yeah. it. Well, that's why we were talking earlier. Like, why is it that getting out of the house to go get stuff done is so much more effective? Like go to a of Starbucks or a Pete's or something, a different venue or or for like the awakening meditation thing, like why is it that I can feel the oneness of the entire yeah. sphere of universe Huge. going out into nature or yeah. even into onto a trail somewhere, whatever it is. Whereas in my house, I'm just like, shit, that paint needs to be redone. Or so true. Because the it's almost like it a is. reminder of our conditioning. We're in it all the time and it and it reinforces egoic sort of Listen, vibration. So this risk of um, work from home, it, it's a yeah, big issue. It's a big thing. I'm seeing a lot of my patients who I even follow their VO2 max by various ways. And even though they're doing the same exercise, they've gotten aerobically more unfit because there is so much more incidental physical activity we did. We'd go to Home Depot, we'd yeah. pick up groceries and yeah. everything's doorstep delivered. Without this incidental activity, we're losing that mitochondrial or that metabolism capacity and heart disease risk is going up. And then what you brought up is so key because we're spending so much time in our home. And many of my patients, they're, they're defiant. They're like, my boss is not gonna tell me to go back in the office. I'm like, listen, I'm not your boss. I'm telling you objectively, if you went into the office a couple of days a week, it might actually do some good. And they come back and say, yeah, I do need to leave the house. I realize that wow. it's good for me. I actually go to public, I love public libraries. Like yeah, I'm in the library and I'll go in through stacks and Mostly I just so much for the, for the young kids. I'm just like to stalk them, give them candy, that kind of thing. Okay, we got to cut the plug on this now. <laughs> I should have stopped the penetration party. I knew you were going to take it a step further. Hey, okay. humor lowers cortisol, man. I'm just saying my glucose. I'm going to check it while you're talking. So you're saying oh, you're geez. saying my, I, 89. Yeah, my heart yeah. rate's 130. I'm an AFib right now. <laughs> I put you in a, I put Shocked you in AFib with a with a joke right. about public libraries. So, so you, yeah, totally. you like but to go again, to public libraries. Changing your environment is, I think, yeah. is super important because a lot of us we're we're self imprisoned in a not just in our home. We're like in one part of the house. That's, that's what same it is. Environment. I mean, it's just it's just not good for us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, and and again, this that re go, relates right back to COVID. Like we have disrupted our lives. Completely. That's why I actually sense there is this general. <clears throat> I've said this publicly before. Recently, after the meditation retreat, I came back and I was like, <laughs> something is different, and yeah. it's not just me. Yeah. Like there's something shifting. Like we're starting to wake up uh, collectively mm -hmm. to this mm -hmm. idea that social media bad. Look what's happening with Twitter. It's falling apart, and totally. no one misses it. Oh no, no, no <laughs> Like, even. you know, like a Sam Harris, I think just left Twitter and he's like, you know what? I was becoming a bad person. Yeah. And I was looking at other people that I, even that I know, and I was thinking they're bad people. And I'm like, what's going on here? This is not yeah, good. Totally. And, right. and even in, in, in like, even with the midterms, regardless of what the results were, it's just people are like, you know what? I don't think I want to play this whole game anymore. Yeah. You know, and I think- We're hitting a saturation point, I think. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Yeah, I hope yeah, so. A yeah, tipping yeah. point where now yeah. people, and the COVID thing was like a trauma where we're stuck in our houses, all the things you were mm. pointing at, metabolically yeah. unfit, increased yeah. mental illness, totally. especially with kids, obesity. Yeah. So, you know, it's these conversations, I think that at least can make people feel like they're not crazy. Like they mm -hmm. intuitively know this, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? Totally. None of it's counterintuitive. Yeah. It's, it's just like, ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and even this, like, 
Yeah. I don't know that I learned anything that I couldn't have intuited into if I had paid attention, yeah. but the truth is I wouldn't have even thought to. That's right. You That's know? so true. Yeah. And now it's like giving me a validation where I'm like, yeah. no, I can dive into that. Yeah, yeah. totally. And you yeah. can really persuade others with some numerical data because you got the left brainers that we still have to convince with numbers. What do you mean stress and glucose? Well, totally. take a look at this, put this on for a couple of weeks and you'll see. Totally. Right? So, and then that, 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 yeah. that glucose curve during the talk is what I'm going to forward to future clients and be like, I'm charging $180,000 yes, yes, exactly. and I want a private check. Yep, totally. And I need a fluffer to prepare yeah, me exactly. before the talk. Yep, totally. Okay, and for 15 per, the yep, and fifteen percent to me, please. So, yeah, and good, of yeah. course to Ron, who's <laughs> right, my so, agent. Yeah, you're right. You would be it's a great right. agent. You have that kind of calm, <laughs> but you right. deal with people that are absolutely crazy like me. Yeah. Like yeah. you know, well, yeah. you know, the thing we'll about Z Dog is, you I'm know, looking for side gig. Yeah, totally. <laughs> dude, you can be my agent. <laughs> right, there we go. Yeah, that'd be great. And, and yeah. as a side note, you can travel with me, and yeah. actually, you can do the talk for me. Oh, that's a good idea. What do you think about that? Let's do it. Teach yeah. people how to manage <laughs> right. their yeah. metabolic health. That's going to be very boring health. compared to your energy, but yeah. Totally. No, I don't think so. <laughs> right, I don't think so. so. You'd be surprised. Um, <laughs> anything right. else that you wanted to, and we, we gave your plug, I'll put the links to all your stuff. Yeah, totally. Which is mainly your website, yeah. right? It's mainly the website. I mean, yeah. to be contradictory to everything, I think during the um, board studying, Instagram's probably the one place I've spent more time just putting research and Great. how do you do a soleus pushup, just practical stuff. Great. But I'm being much more disciplined about just going in, posting and getting the hell out of there. Yeah, good. You know? So yeah, that's Don't key. stay, so, don't linger. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. Actually, you know, let me let me tell you one thing that I yeah. think I'm gonna do a separate Please. video on yeah. that that's just fatherly advice Please. from you're, one, you know, You're the age. expert, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Please help me. This guy, Peter Lindbergh, runs a site called The Stoa and he's a kind of a philosopher, like one of these modern philosophers. And he looks at, the social media thing as something he calls second selfing. So we have our primary self, which is our kind of in-person mm. persona. Yeah. Then there's the true self, which is no self, exactly right. <laughs> which is yeah. infinity. Yeah. But so we manifest as this self, but then the second self is the self we put out into the world on social media mm -hmm. platforms, yeah. whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, yeah. LinkedIn even. Totally. It's a kind of a avatar. Yeah. And there's ways to do that and there's ways to do that. And if the second self is really authentic to the to the true self mm -hmm. or the primary self, it can show up in certain ways, but there are there are aspects of second selfing that can become very harmful emotionally, mm -hmm. physically, mm -hmm. and financially even, mm -hmm. right? You can get canceled, yeah. all these things can yeah. happen. So one of the things that happens is a parasocial projection. And that means that people know you from your social media, they mm -hmm. know your second self, yeah. and they project onto it, onto your, actual self mm -hmm. who they think you are. Mm. So if I get recognized in public, I'm Doc Vader, yeah. or I'm the guy who did the moral injury video, or yeah. I'm the guy who does meditation. It's, it's sure. all different and yeah. it's the parasocial yeah. projection. Mm. So you have to be able to roll with that without getting triggered by it, going, oh, you don't know who I am. Mm. Well, of course not, yeah. but they know your second self. So what's your second self putting out there? Yeah. The other thing that happens is um, capture mm -hmm. and addiction. So what you pointed out with Instagram, mm -hmm. You're using Instagram as a tool yeah. because you know it's gonna reach people. Yes. And it's gonna do good in the world. Yeah. But what happens when you get captured by the same tool? And in other words, you start to get sucked into these social media battles and the addiction component of the doom scrolling mm -hmm. and the pulling the slot machine and mm -hmm. seeing how many likes you get and yeah. that kind of thing. And that can be very harmful and distracting yeah. Yeah. in all the ways you pointed out earlier. Totally. Um, and there are other things like internal capitalism. Yeah. So we internalize a kind of a, a, a marketing mindset where we're like, well, how many likes is this gonna get? Or will mm -hmm. this generate revenue? And then that captures us to a certain way of being yeah. as a second self. Like, yeah. oh, if I talk about COVID, I will nail all the stats and make a ton mm -hmm. of money. Got it, yeah. And we saw this yeah. during COVID with, yeah. with people that never were on social media, doctors mm -hmm. and others. Yeah. They're now on social media all the time. Totally, yeah. So, true. and those are just three of the things that, um, Good advice. that can happen. Yeah. Um, it's made me extremely empathetic to what teens face. As totally. much as we're critical, put that device away but man, we know all this. It's such a slippery slope, like we're going sucked to that right media. Into it. So yeah, absolutely. Sucked right into it. Yeah. Um, it's, it, and we get in our own group think and we get in, it's just totally, really. Totally. So all these things are to say, emotional metabolism. Yeah. The biopsychosocial aspects of us. Yeah. Lifestyle. Yes, um, totally. All of it actually matters more than has so ever So interconnected, been. right? I mean, yeah. before, I mean, we try to separate these topics, but they're so intertwined. You just can't, right? I don't no. think we've ever had a topic where we've talked about metabolism. We haven't hit, you know, All psychosocial. Yeah, and this is like directly, the CGM is like connecting the dots in a very quantitative way for people. I love it. So, it's the yeah. corpus callosum between our left that's and our right. That's exactly right. That's yeah. really what it is. Yeah. That's, and that's a great way to wrap the show. What do you think? I think it's awesome. Dude. Good stuff. So we'll link, what's your website again? Yeah, so culturalhealthsolutions.com. 
So Perfect. it's a mouthful, but yeah, you can check everything out. And there. on Instagram, what are you? It's Ronish Sinha MD. R O N E S H S I N H A M D M D. Okay, good. perfect. And I'll put those links in. And uh, you'll come back and do more shows. I hope. I should. I haven't like absolutely raised your glucose too much. Not enough to prevent me from coming back. Okay, I'll, good. I'll do a shot of insulin before, so perfect. it's all good. So because yeah, if I throw right. you into DKA, <laughs> or actually <laughs> hyperosmolar co- non-ketotic coma That's is what right. you would yeah. have. Yeah, because yeah, you totally. have insulin. Yeah. See? That's the stuff that I studied in the boards, RTAs, but not lifestyle medicine. Yeah. Yeah. You're studying <laughs> right. like, you know, uh, metabolic store. What is it? Those, um, uh, those, uh, glycosphingolipidoses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jeez, right. All that man. useful stuff. Very useful. I see those every day. I mean, it's there we just, go. <laughs> I love how we come full circle. Yeah. It, all, it is to the boards, <laughs> right, totally. to the boards. ABIM, I'm looking Thank at you. you. <laughs> right, I got the totally. death stare. <laughs> Right, totally. Ron, awesome. thanks a million, guys. You know awesome. what to do. And I have to say this because I realized this was a game that you have to play in social media. Okay. If you don't tell people exactly what to do, they don't do it. Okay. So if you're watching on YouTube, hit that little subscribe button and the little bell next to it to turn your notifications on so that you'll never miss an episode from us. On a podcast, we're actually really focusing on the audio quality. So on your favorite podcast, you can find us subscribe and leave a review, whether it's iTunes, Spotify, whatever, your Google Play, whatever you're listening to, and um, share the video. And if you wanna support our show, there's always a link somewhere to our supporter tribe where you can join for five bucks a month or you can give us a one-time donation at paypal.me forward slash ZDogMD. And if you're donating for Ron, uh, write in the comments, because I respond to every email, right? This is for Ron. And what'll happen is when we go to dinner, Yes. I'll take any donations that people have given because they love your show <gasps> wow. and I will spend it on hookers and blow oh God. that we Jeez. are gonna have. See, I knew I wanted to make him uncomfortable at the very end. It totally works. I'll spend it on a delicious <laughs> dessert and a meal for us. All right. So guys, I love you. I love you too, Ron. I love it's you too, really man. It's really been a joy. I love your audience. Thanks so much for letting me be and, here. And they love you and uh, we are out. Peace. All right. <laughs>